Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad that some people made it here on this beautiful Saturday afternoon after lunch break and everything. So thanks for being here. I'm Martin Pitt. I'm from Red Hat's cockpit team. But unlike in the previous years, I'm not going to talk about cockpit today, but about collaborating between upstream projects. <clears throat> and so there is a traditional feedback cycle for how it changes, or in my case, particularly regressions, become visible to consumers of your project. Like initially, it always starts with some upstream proposed change, like in the PR or an MR, and then maybe some of your own tests start and, and run, and then you discuss them a little bit, and eventually they land. And then later on, you make an upstream release, and then yet later on, some of the distributions uh, pick it up and package it and publish it in their archives. And this process up to here, this can take, like, depending on your project, can take days to months even. Like, if you, are, if, you do con, uh, if you do frequent releases upstream and it's raw height, then people get to see it pretty quickly. But if we are talking about long-term releases, RHEL and so on, this can literally take months. <coughs> and then, of course, one of the consumers of your project might then come along and see the new release of your package or the library or whatever, and then spots a regression and reports it to you. And this is really demotivating at this point, right? Consider this was the actual cause was months ago. All the context of what happened there or even where it happens is completely gone from your brain. And like as in your project, you probably have zero motivation to look at it again because you switched to something else long, long ago. <clears throat> And then, of course, maybe some of these regressions get fixed and they have to go through the same cycle again, like wait for the next upstream release. Of course, there are some shortcuts, but in general, it takes too long. <coughs> and in Cockpit, we are sitting on the top of the dependency tree. We talk to over 100 system APIs, which means that we are going to see a lot of these operating system regressions. So this is why we built a rather elaborate system for tracking and finding them, and this is an excerpt, like uh, you see there's a break in the middle. <laughs> it's an excerpt from our bots page, which uh, essentially has proxies for all these regressions that we report to the uh, upstream projects and downstream distros. And you see there's quite a lot of them. And the oldest one is like from 2018. And these are all current. We automatically close them if they don't uh, apply anymore. And so you, you can safely say like these are never going to be fixed because RHEL 7 is dead. And like even those, like the rare crashes, like nobody is going to fix them. Let's be realistic. But of course, all of these are bugs that consumers and users are going to see. And we have like five more of them or so every week. So this, in my opinion, this clearly doesn't work. <clears throat> because yeah, at this point, the damage is done. So what I propose is to radically tighten this feedback cycle from months to essentially now and immediate. So in the fancy parlance of today, this is called shift left. So what I would like to see is whenever someone proposes an upstream change, then not only your own tests uh, start uh, running this, but you select a few key consumers of your project or API, and then run their tests in your pull request as well. And this has the nice uh, effect that you immediately spot regressions if your change breaks them. Uh, first of all, you get the feedback immediately. You have all the context in your head. Like everyone knows what's going on. You don't need to bisect changes or anything. And this is also a natural place to interact with the consumer projects. Like maybe they need to, to change something. But this provides a natural place to collaborate. And this way, like you iterate on your pull requests until all the tests are green. And then you can land the thing with confidence that like in a few months in the future, you don't have to touch this thing again. And that way you can really stop yelling at each other between the projects and start building better relationships. They might include beverages of your choice or not, but uh, at least you can uh, like concentrate on better efforts. <clears throat> and the cool thing is about, about that is, this is a solved technical problem. You can do all of this with publicly available infrastructure, like it's not restricted to any paywall or company. So with Coper and the testing farm and Packet to bind it all together, you can do this right now if you are on GitHub or GitLab. <clears throat> so the main assumption there is that your, your consumer projects already run some tests with TMT. 
And there was actually a pretty good chance of that happening because a few years ago, uh, RHEL mandated TMT tests called gating tests in their software project. And it's increasingly more popular in Fedora as well, especially because they're relatively easy to enable. So the main thing you need to convince your consumer project to do is to provide like an up-to-date build of their main branch or branches, whichever branches you want to test. Uh, Packet does this for you. It's four lines of YAML. It's not a big deal. You just need to tell your consumer projects to do this. And this is useful for other things, like uh, it gives users the chance to test landed changes very early and conveniently and so on. And then you need another, uh, then in your project, uh, you can run the test plans of your consumer projects rather easily in your own packet configuration. Now, this is a bit of a more involved YAML. I don't want to bore you to death with that. It's just a technicality. But trust me, it's a copy pasta exercise. And I'll give you the link of what you have to do. And if you do this, then all your pull requests will all of a sudden include like these new statuses. Like this is an excerpt from, I think, a Stratus or a UDISC pull request. So their own tests are called local. And we hooked our cockpit storage tests in there. And so we know that that Stratus pull request will not break cockpit and all of our own integration tests. So it's not intrusive as long as it works, like it doesn't get in the way. Uh, but of course, if it fails, then that Stratus pull request would be the place to discuss it. <clears throat> so we put this into action a couple of months ago, maybe half a year or so. Um, back then, Podman used to be one of our main sources of these regressions. And yeah, uh, it didn't really help. The, uh, like, it did, we did some pet tension between the teams. Like, we kept saying, like, ah, you need to build tests for your API, and they never quite did. And now we set this up, and in fact, we are their API tests now. So this has completely made this problem gone away. So in just a few days after we put this up, we found the first regression in an upstream PR. You can click on it on the slides. And that was a really nice experience. Like within two hours or so, we spotted the problem. We discussed it a little bit in a very friendly tone. And then uh, the submitter changed the code. Everything was green. We had our nice weekend. And everything was hunky-dory. And since then, we basically stopped sending regression bugs to them. <clears throat> And so I must say this works a lot better now, and we have a better relationship. But you need to be aware this must be an opt-in process. So you really need to talk to this other project up front, of course, and set up some ground rules. Like when your tests fail, who is going to look at it, in which time frame, or what do we do with failures. And so Packet helps a little bit with this, so you don't need to to follow all of their project's pull requests, but it can send these automatic notifications when something fails, and then pull in a few of your project's developers. This is not like super, uh, like, uh, like super complex yet now, but it gets the job done. We just probably still need to refine it a little bit. <clears throat> and yeah, so as I said, this doesn't scale well, but it helps. And so exactly how to do this, this is described in the blog post. So this gives you all the YAML links, examples, and so on. It's there. It's also on the Cockpit homepage. And of course, if you have more questions on how to set it up, please talk to me. You can ask us in the Cockpit channel or by email or whatever else. OK, thanks. Any questions about that? <clears throat> yeah. Thanks to Miro. Microphones behind you. Well, not really a question, but I was talking to these Conflux guys, and it seems they have a nice solution for also projects where you cannot, the project doesn't want to include your uh, cockpit, your tests, right? Your integration tests. So they are using actually sub modules for that and automatically creating merge requests, mm -hmm. like uh, when they change comes in. So it's also a solvable problem, seems, or it will be able to solve it, e even if the upstream or the, the, the project that you depend on doesn't want to get the tests running in there. GitHub ah, for okay. reason. Yeah. So I guess that gives you the the yeah that, yes. that, that went on the on the recording. Yeah. You will be so I guess you don't need to. Mirroring, yeah. But yeah. it can be set up in a way that it will automatically mirror create the changes and PR for it and you will know at least the change 
happened yeah. right away. I'm not saying that is a solution, but right, but I got an idea from them. This is how they are solving their problems in complex. Okay, yeah, so. yeah, that might be like the, the 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 last way out, I guess. I mean, it was a hard sell to the Podman team, I must say. We discussed this quite a lot, and they were not quite convinced. But I mean, since it's still in existence, and they even applied it to some of their own projects, I hope that. It's stuck. And we since then enabled it to SL Linux and UDISC and Stratus, and generally it's working quite well. But of course, my main point is talk to each other, like collaborate, because in the long run, it helps both projects. I mean, it might, it might be perceived as slowing down the pull requests, but you, you save all this debugging time and these annoyances down the road, and you just naturally collaborate. And it has worked pretty well for us, I must say. So always try this first before you kind of build this mirroring infrastructure. Yeah. This maintainer summoning thing of yours in the commits, can it also check the base commit of the pull request? Because it kind of feels naturally that if the new commit fails and it's a regression, you need to summon the maintainers of one project. And if the old commit also fails, you have to summon maintainers of the other project. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that can certainly uh, happen. I mean, we see this all the time. Like, for example, when you run test on Rawhide, Rawhide is still an unmitigated disaster. I mean, everything fails all the time because of unrelated reasons, and that is indeed a pain point. Like, we always have times when, like, Rawhide fails everywhere, and then we kind of need to do emergency actions to quickly disable tests or, like, do whatever other workarounds to make everything green. And we usually notify the project maintainers of upstream, like, yeah, Rawheim is broken because of Bugzilla here. And then they usually understand and say, yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody feels that pain. But my hope is, of course, that Rawhide really shouldn't be that like that. <laughs> if we take CI seriously and all the tests that we can find with machines, we actually do find them with machines and don't land them with Fedora, that we avoid this treadmill and everyone perceiving that Rawhide is a disaster, yeah, right? My point was twofold. One is it's automatable deciding who to assign blame to. And ah. the other one, I'm looking forward to a follow-up talk when you say, uh, tell us the statistics of who broke it more often. <laughs> yeah, the who is pretty clear here, but the, uh, if, you, if you say like the, 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 the main, their main commits already fail your tests, yeah, then uh, this is a failure which you, but in theory, it shouldn't happen anymore with this, but of course in practice it happens because there's third party libraries or whatever which break everything else, yeah. Um, I think maybe I answer your question. Uh, the, it's not just Podman that's running the cockpit integration tests on every Podman commit, but the cockpit Podman project is then running exactly those same tests on every cockpit Podman commit. So in theory, as long as we only land green PRs, sort of like this one's gated on this one and this one's gated on this one. Hmm. So it's not just like it can happen that main suddenly goes red for some reason because then that commit would not have landed in the Podman on cockpit side. Mm -hmm. Actually, on our, is what you meant. Sorry, yeah. on our CI, we completely solved that problem by essentially pinning down the base images. So the only thing that changes there is the local make, make, install, essentially. And then we, rebase, uh, we refresh these images separately. So we completely exclude these third-party uh, regressions. On the testing farm right now, we just use the standard, like the, 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 the floating images, which update all the time. Uh, I was talking to Miro yesterday, we might change this and kind of pin them down. So that would be the next step of that evolution. But hopefully most projects aren't so complex and maybe don't have this kind of wide API space. So I'd say give it a try and then you have to adjust the workflow. I mean, it's, it, this is still pretty young, so. Yeah, or that, or do a comparison, yeah. That's, for, that's what like Debian also do. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's good. Okay, cool. Well then, thanks for your attention. Huh? <laughs>